So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Srinivasa, um, who's faculty at Harvard Medical School, a clinician in neuroendocrine and pituitary tumor clinical center, and a physician investigator in the metabolism unit at MGH. She serves as the co-director of the Miracles HIV program. Um, her clinical research trajectory has concentrated on exploring mechanisms and treatment strategies for inflammation and cardiometabolic disease in HIV. She's received multiple awards in recognition of her work, including um, NIH R01s and K23s, Harvard, Harvard Catalyst Medical Research Investigator Training Award, and many, many others. She's a recipient of the Endocrine Society Early Investigator Award and the Cora Young Investigator Scholarship, as well as a two-time recipient of the Women in Endocrinology Young Investigator Award. And she's going to weigh in on GLP-1 receptor agonists for people with HIV. Um, so thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here today as part of this wonderful program. Um, and we'll be talking about GLP-1 um, receptor agonists or GLP-1-RAs. I think throughout the program today already, we've hit upon weight gain in, in so many aspects in terms of um, just ART, pregnancy, um, and uh, more, more recently, hypertension. So I think this is particularly relevant. Um, and really, this is meant to be a practical talk from the perspective of an endocrinologist, and I hope you can take um, some of this um, information and make it useful in your clinical setting. Um, here are our learning objectives for today. And what I'll really do is um, set the context of these medications um, with what is known about them in the general population, and then we'll go into what is known uh, about these uh, medications in HIV as well. So by way of background, we've heard today, of course, um, obesity is rising in prevalence. Um, weight gain has been associated with ART initiation and generally does not improve with switching ART regimens. Um, with regards to ART initiation, um, and shown here in the graph, a pooled analysis of RCTs um, showed higher weight gain in those receiving INSTI or TAF-containing regimens when compared to those receiving um, TDF, Abacavir, or Zyduvidine, Zyvud sorry about that. Um, with regards to the INSTIs, Dalutegravir and Victegravir have been most um, consistently implicated um, with INSTI-associated weight gain. And in general, the weight gain tends to occur early on after ART initiation. Um, it's thought that about a fifth of um, individuals will gain um, about 10% of their body weight. We also know that about a fifth of individuals will transition BMI categories um, from normal to overweight and overweight to obese um, with regards to initiation. Now, um, with regards to switch, again, a pooled analysis of RCTs have really demonstrated that there is moderate weight gain. Um, and those that are switched off of um, efavirenz and um, TDS, TDF actually have the greatest weight gain. And we touched a little bit before upon um, potentially the weight suppressive effects of TDF. And really the benefits of that still remain um, unclear in terms of, you know, the risk benefit and in, in ART switch. And additional risk factors for weight gain to be aware of um, include women with HIV, um, low CD4 count, a high viral load, as well as black race. So of course there are consequences to weight gain, which we've been hearing about. And in this recent study, um, they showed um, that among persons with HIV on various ART regimens, that there was a mean weight gain over 48 weeks of about 3.6 kilograms. And among those participants that um, you know, had greater than 10% of weight gain, it was found that they had a twofold increased risk of diabetes and metabolic syndrome, and a one and a half fold increased risk of a cardiometabolic event. And complementary to this, um, the participants who lost 5% of their baseline weight had a lower incident rate of metabolic syndrome. So really this speaks to the efficacy potentially of, of weight loss. Um, so glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1, 
is an incretin hormone. It's secreted from the small intestine in response to food ingestion. And then it stimulates um, insulin secretion as well as inhibits glucagon release. And the, both of these mechanisms contribute to decreasing glucose production. Um, and the class of medications, GLP-1 receptor agonists, mimic GLP-1 physiologically. And based on these mechanisms, these medications were originally leveraged for their use in diabetes. Um, and we'll go over some of the data for that. Um, and these studies of diabetes actually showed additional benefit to weight loss. So in that regard, more directed studies were done um, in order to understand their benefit in weight loss. Um, and these agents can uh, work in the brain to suppress appetite. They work in the gut to slow gastric emptying. Together, this can increase satiety. And these are mechanisms of which may account for their utility in obesity. All right, and so there are actually GLP-1 receptors widely throughout the body, and this probably con contributes their broad potential biologic action. It extends to other um, tissues such as the heart, kidney, um, and the liver, as well as muscle. So in that respect, these medications are quite appealing. And even though we were joking earlier, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, other indications that um, come forth over the years in terms of the potential for these medications. All right, so listed here are um, all of the GLP-1 RAs. We actually have a lot. Um, you may be familiar with semi-glutide, liraglutide, and dulaglutide. So the majority of these preparations are given as sub-Q injections, another injection, of course. Um, the exception to this is that there is an oral preparation of semi-glutide. However, this is only indicated for use in diabetes. Um, with regards to weight loss, only subcutaneous uh, semi-glutide and liraglutide are indicated for weight loss. Um, the semi-glutide is administered weekly, the liraglutide daily, um, and they are given at higher doses um, for weight loss. And so um, the other thing to be aware of is that they are marketed under different names based on their indications, so you'll need to really prescribe accordingly. All right, so their efficacy on A1C is shown in this chart here. In general, the GLP-1s will reduce A1C by about one to one and a half points, and semi-glutide um, may um, have some benefit up to two points, which is great. Um, so in the past, there's been concerns about cardiovascular safety of diabetes medications, uh, namely rosiglitazone, which had been associated with heart attacks as well as heart failure. And so because of that, the FDA now mandates that um, large cardiovascular outcome trials are performed on all new diabetes therapies. And this is why we have um, information on these medications in this way. Um, and instead of causing a control, or rather even a neutral response, these medications actually had an overwhelming benefit on cardiovascular mor mortality um, in those with existing or high-risk cardiovascular disease. Um, so this is an important nuance, um, as we heard some of the terminology before, that these are, um, you know, this is more of um, in, in secondary prevention. We do not yet know how these medications affect cardiovascular mortality in individuals that do not have any known um, cardiovascular disease or low risk. Um, in addition, um, some of these medications have provided nephropathy benefit as well. All right, so the efficacy on weight loss. The STEP-8 trial helped us um, really think about this with regards to um, the differences between semi-glutide and liraglutide, and this was among overweight and obese individuals without diabetes. And what you can see here is that um, the greatest weight loss occurred with semi-glutide. It was about two, and a two, two to two and a half times more than that was achieved with liraglutide. You can see here the mean weight change was about minus 16% with semi-glutide, minus 6% with liraglutide. Um, and in terms of absolute changes, you get about 15, a uh, reduction of 15 kilograms with semi-glutide and seven kilograms with liraglutide. And in general, larger proportions of individuals achieve greater weight loss with semi-glutide. So in this way, we think of the semi-glutide preparation as being more robust for weight loss. And just shown here, you can see that the weight loss achieved with semi-glutide is actually much greater than other medications that we've had in the past to work with for weight loss. And even in addition to weight loss, you can see that it's about, you know, three times more effective, potentially. 
All right, so I told you before that there were, uh, there is cardiovascular benefit to these medications among those with diabetes. So the SELECT trial went on to investigate cardiovascular outcomes among those with um, obesity without diabetes. So they enrolled individuals with a BMI greater than 27 with, again, pre-existing cardiovascular disease. Um, and the primary endpoint that they looked at was um, composite death from CV causes, non-fatal MI, or stroke. Um, and what they saw was actually a 20% risk reduction among those treated with semi-glutide. So this is quite impressive here that you have a medication that has dual benefits to reduce weight as well as reduce cardiovascular mortality, even in the absence of diabetes. All right, so with that, the current indications for these medications were derived. So this medication is not to be used in type 1 diabetes as of now, um, where the underlying pathology is actually insulin uh, deficiency versus insulin resistance as in type 2 diabetes, but is actively being studied. With regard to individuals with type 2 diabetes, this can be used first line if they have established um, ASCVD or kidney disease. Um, they can be used in the absence of known heart disease or kidney disease when the A1C is greater than nine or when the A1C is less than nine and weight gain is a concern. Um, with regards to um, obesity, these medications can be prescribed when the BMI is greater than uh, 30 or when the BMI is greater than 27 and there's a weight-related comorbidity as well. And um, the individual must have demonstrated there was a failure of lifestyle modification. And recently, just you know, one or two weeks ago, um, based on the data that I just showed you from the SELECT trial, the FDA approval has now expanded um, the use of semi-glutide um, in obesity also to those that have a known risk of heart disease. And this is actually um, you know, going to have really, I think, far-reaching implications for insurance approval um, because it has been extremely hard to get some of these medications for our patients. All right, in terms of potential side effects to be aware of, um, injection site reactions just with as with any other injection. Um, the risk of hypoglycemia is really thought to be low with these medications, um, and maybe you see it more in combination when they're used concomitantly with some of the classes of the other antihyperglycemics like sulfonylureas, glenides, and insulin. Um, the gastrointestinal side effects are often what preclude patients from continuing these medications, and they can occur in up to half of um, individuals. Um, we do worry about giving these medications to those who've had a prior history of pancreatitis, um, although you know newer data is starting to suggest perhaps um, that maybe these medications don't exacerbate um, pancreatitis, but um, we still exercise caution. Um, biliary disease can occur as well. Acute renal insufficiency is really quite rare, and this may be mostly reported um, in the setting of perhaps GI symptoms and, and hypovolemia that may accompany that. There is a black box warning for medullary thyroid cancer. Um, its use is um, contraindicated actually in those with a personal or family history. So um, with regards to dosing, there are suggested dosing um, ranges for the medications. Um, however, you may want to delay dose escalation if you can't, if the uh, individual cannot tolerate because of side effects. And really the ideal clinical strategy is to start low and go slow. It could be that they may be able to tolerate the medication over time and the symptoms subside. Um, and if there are several missed doses or the preparations are being switched, um, you may need to restart at a lower dose, again, to avoid side effects. Um, and keep in mind that the maintenance dose may actually be a submaximal dosing. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be the max dosing. You really want to, uh, the goal really is to achieve the greatest weight loss um, um, in the absence of side effects. And this is just a reminder that these medications need to be held preoperatively to avoid aspiration events. Um, because of the uh, delayed gastric emptying, we worry about stomach contents. All right. Now, other risks. So uh, we did mention medullary thyroid cancer, but there has been some concern over the potential association with other malignancies. Um, however, um, in one study in which they mined the FDA AE reporting database, 
Um, they did see a signal with these medications with certain tumors, but overall they concluded that this did not, these medications do not cause a disproportionate increase in tumor cases. Um, and other things that have come up, the Icelandic Medicines Agency actually reported about 150 cases of suicidal and self-injurious behaviors with these medications. Um, they reported that to the European Medicines Agency, and this also prompted an FDA investigation into this. And this here, again, is data from uh, a study that mined the FDA AE reporting database. And again, it was concluded that there was no signal of disproportional reporting of an association between these medications and these suicidal and self-injurious behaviors. Nonetheless, you know, we do, um, you know, exercise caution with these medications. Um, and really, you know, s one thought about why these behaviors presented is that potentially obesity and mental health are, are essentially comorbidities of each other. And it could be regardless of the medications. All right, so combination GLP-1s are really evolving these days, and while not the focus of today's talk, you should be aware of them. Um, terzepatide is a dual action um, agent that has GLP-1 and GIP, which is glucon glucose in, um, dependent insulotropic polypeptide. And really the thought is here that by combining multiple gut hormones, um, you'll get synergistic metabolic effects. And you can see here as shown on the right that GIP has similar effects in that it um, stimulates insulin secretion. It does have some varying effects on appetite and suppression and gastric emptying um, as uh, compared to um, GLP-1. Um, nonetheless, these medications were found to be um, very beneficial. You can see here that the A1C um, and the mean weight loss changes were more robust than those achieved with the single agents. And because of that, these were approved for diabetes and just a few months ago were also approved for obesity. Now, one clinical concern that comes up is, are these chronic medications? Do you have to stay on them? And so this study helped us answer this question. This is the Sermont 4 trial where they were um, looking at terzepatide. Um, all of these um, participants were on a lead-in period, and then um, they were randomized either to continue their terzepatide or to have the terzepatide withdrawn and go on placebo. And what you can see here was that, you know, um, there was significant weight, gain, weight regain. Um, those that went on placebo um, regained 14% uh, of their weight. You can see the graph here starts to separate right away, so it starts right away. Um, and this is quite concerning. And while I didn't show you data with regards to the single agents, um, it's very similar to what is shown here. And so that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, there's also an idea clinically that comes up of tachyphylaxis in that your patients may experience a plateau um, in the response to these medications. And we're still trying to understand that further. All right, so with weight gain, we wanna understand the different fat depots. It's very important. Um, so a subcutaneous fat is um, thought of as the pinchable fat. You do need some subcutaneous fat because it's where you store your triglycerides. And um, in states where there's a lack of subcutaneous fat or there's an excess subcutaneous fat and it's thought to be dysfunctional, you need somewhere to store your triglycerides. They then overflow into what is known as uh, the visceral adipose tissue or the VAT, and this is a highly inflamed depot and has been linked to metabolic complications and is um, thought to be more of a detrimental depot. So um, when we think about um, lipodystrophy associated with HIV, this is a low SAT, high VAT phenotype. And so the ideal clinical strategy in this situation would be to reduce VAT while preserving SAT. Um, so we do have, um, uh, you know, at our, um, in access to us, to samarelin, which is a growth hormone releasing hormone analog. And it has been shown to reduce VAT by about 15%. And what's nice about it is that it preferentially um, um, does not um, reduce the SAT. Now, this may be in contrast to obesity, in which we think of as a high SAT, high VAT phenotype. And in this situation, the ideal clinical strategy may be to reduce both VAT and SAT and that's where the GLP-1 agonists come in. Um, other things to be um, conscientious with this met these medications are thinking about the fat versus the lean mass depots. And this is particularly relevant as we know um, as persons with HIV are aging, um, we worry about sarcopenia in which the risk may be sixfold higher. 
And in this scenario, um, the ideal clinical strategy may be actually to preserve lean body mass. Um, so we gained some insight into how these, all these depots change with the step one trial. And with semi-glutide, what they saw was that there was a relative total fat mass reduction of 20%, about 19, 20%. A relative um, VAT reduction of about 27%, and there was also a relative lean body mass reduction of about 10%. Now, thinking about this lean body mass, just to put that in context, um, this lean body mass loss accounted for about 40% of the total weight loss here. And just to compare that to other regimens that we can use for weight loss or even lifestyle, typically the um, lean mass accounts for about 20 to 30% of this weight loss. So you can see it's really the rapidity and the amount of lean mass that is lost with these medications that may be of concern. Um, however, it's noted that really the proportion of lean mass that is lost is much less than the fat mass's loss overall. All right, so now let's turn to some data about what is known um, in HIV. And these were data that were recently presented at CROI. Um, this was an observational study from the CNICS cohort assessing the impact of semi-glutide initiation. Um, these are um, among individuals that are engaged in clinical care and they were evaluating weight change after one year. The majority of these individuals did have a history of diabetes. And you can see here on average, um, persons with HIV lost about 6% of their body weight and about 6.5 kilograms. Um, it was seen that there was larger weight reduction with higher BMIs. And on the right here, you'll see here stratified by BMI class, um, the amount of weight loss, and those that were in obesity class three tended to lose more weight than those in the other classes. And this was a retrospective study assessing um, GLP-1 RAs on metabolic outcomes among individuals with diabetes with and without HIV. And what they saw here was that the um, mean weight change was actually significantly higher among those with diabetes and HIV compared to diabetes alone. You can see here there was a loss of about 10 kilograms versus two kilograms. Um, there tended to be a higher, uh, uh, sorry, a, uh, chain, a bigger change in A1C among those with diabetes and A1C as well, though not significant. And, you know, these data start to suggest maybe there is some increased efficacy in diabetes and HIV, but really pr we need prospective studies to understand this further. All right, and so Grace McComsey and her team presented these data um, at um, ID Week, and this was very exciting. It was the first randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of semi-glutide um, versus placebo. Um, they were given a low dose of semi-glutide at one uh, milligram, and they enrolled individuals with a BMI greater than 25 who had increased waist circumference. So they were selecting for individuals with lipo lipohypertrophy. And um, their data shown here on the right, what you can see is that semi-glutide significantly reduced the visceral depot by 13% compared to a 5% increase in placebo. Um, the semi-glutide significantly reduced the subcutaneous adipose tissue by 13% compared to a 1.5 increase in placebo. And they went on to also look at total fat and lean mass here. And you can see that the medication significantly decreased both of those depots as well. Again, while there was some lean mass loss, the net effect appeared to be on fat mass. And again, this, this just to emphasize the point, these medications will decrease weight in general, so that's affecting all the depots here. And this may, you know, um, uh, be important to your clinical management as there may be some phenotypes, again, in which you may want to preserve SAT, like a lipoatrophy, um, or there may be some phenotypes where you want to preserve lean body mass, like sarcopenia, and this is in contrast to generalized obesity. They also went on to look at, um, interestingly, inflammatory uh, markers in this study, and what they saw was that there was a significant decrease in CRP, IL-6, and CD-163 um, with the semi-glutide when compared to placebo. Interestingly, these changes were independent of VAT and weight. Um, but, you know, this starts to suggest again, um, is there some anti-inflammatory potential to these medications aside from their weight gain? And I don't think we know that 
uh, for sure, but there are data in the general population also that suggest that these medications also decrease these inflammatory markers. All right, and Jordan Lake went on to present some exciting results from the slim liver study as well. And this was the study of semi-glutide for metabolic dysfunction associated, associated stea stea steatotic uh, liver disease, apologies, um, otherwise known as MASLD. And this is new nomenclature for what was previously known as NAFLD. Um, so this was an ACTG study. Um, it was over 24 weeks, and again, they used a low dose of semi-glutide at one milligram. It was open label, and they enrolled individuals on ART who had a um, increased waist circumference. They had pre-existing insulin resistance or pre-diabetes, and um, they also were expected to have a baseline intrahepatic triglyceride content greater than 5% on MRI. That last criteria being important, um, meaning that everyone had mazzled at baseline that went into the study. And they saw some quite impressive results. There was um, a 4.2% redu absolute reduction in the intrahepatic triglyceride content and a relative reduction of about 31%. About a third of individuals actually had resolution of MASLD. Um, the improvements seemed to be correlated with weight loss and were accompanied and correlated by other um, metabolic um, reductions in glucose, IR, A1C, and triglycerides. Um, so this is really exciting to see that these medications, um, you know, while we did see an effect on the visceral fat, may extend also to other ectopic fat depots um, here. Um, they also um, provided some secondary um, analyses on data on the effects of semi-glutide on muscle structure and function, which again is important for us to sort of understand with the increased risk of sarcopenia and frailty um, in HIV. And um, they went about this by studying the psoas muscle, which is important to posture as well as um, the strength and function in the um, hips as well as the upper leg. And what they saw was that the individuals that were randomized to semi-glutide have an overall loss of muscle volume, and it tended to be greater um, among those were, who were older, greater than 60, um, which may be concerning. Um, however, um, they didn't see any changes um, in the fat in the muscle. And with regards to function, um, they, s they tested this by the chair rise time and the gait speed. Um, these were relatively preserved and perhaps tended to improve, though not significant. And so really you get this discordance that we're seeing here that there is loss of muscle, but perhaps your structure is, or your function is preserved. I think we really need to uh, further studies to understand this, but this starts to give us a little more insight about the lean uh, mass compartment and what's happening with the muscle. All right, potential interactions to be aware of with these um, medications. So they're really not expected to pose any significant um, drug interactions via their metabolism. Um, that is because they're degraded via um, endopeptidases. Um, they are known, uh, as we talked about their mechanism, um, to inhibit gastric acid secretion and delay gastric emptying. And so because the um, dissolution absorption of um, two medications in particular, um, atazanavir and oral rapivirine, may be affected by this change in pH. Um, you know, um, you may need to um, advise your patients to take the oral form of the semi-glutide um, two to four hours before those medications, but really this thought, it's thought that this effect is so minimal. All right, so other potential targets um, that, um, to take into consideration um, with these medications that are actively being studied. Um, so we think about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF. So obesity has been linked to HEFPEF. And in the STEF HEFPEF trial, um, of those with HEFPEF and obesity in the general population, um, they saw that semi-glutide actually led to reductions in symptoms and physical limitations among these um, individuals, and also there was greater improvement in exercise function. Um, however, the study was not powered for clinical events, and so we do not know how this translates more so into, say, for instance, hospitalizations for heart failure. Um, but this is important. As we know, myocardial dysfunction is also increased in persons with HIV and can lead to a HEFPEF um, phenotype. There's also been um, some potential benefit 
perhaps to addictive disorders that's being studied. And uh, mainly it's been um, in preclinical studies where they've identified um, you know, reductions in substance use and attenuation of drug-seeking behaviors. Again, mainly in rodent models, and this has extended over alcohol, nicotine, opioids, cocaine, and amphetamines. Um, however, there's very few um, human studies um, that have looked into this. There was one particular um, study of humans with alcohol use disorder in which um, upon going on a GLP-1, they did see a reduction in alcohol consumption. And interestingly, it happened to be in the subset of individuals who were obese. So there might be some overlapping um, reward pathways that are being affected um, in these in the obesity population. All right, so with that, I just um, um, would like to uh, take any questions. If we have any questions, people coming up to the mic. Let's see, great. Um, Thank you so much, that was really helpful. I was wondering, um, you know, I guess in general with like ozempic mania, I feel like, like as a society, we're sort of not talking about medullary thyroid cancer. And so I guess both for the general population and for patients with HIV specifically, like how concerned are you about like an impending wave of medullary thyroid carcinoma <laughs> cases? And like, how long do you think it will take us to know whether that's happening? Great, yeah, so there are more common forms of, you know, thyroid cancer that we think of in our patients. So when, you, you know, a thyroid nodule comes up, it's not, you know, to have medullary thyroid cancer is one of the more rare. So I don't think, unless these come up more so in genetic um, syndrome, so there's multiple endocrine neoplasia type two, in which, you know, the patient may have like a more of a syndrome of um, endocrine, um, 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 issues, and then with, in which case that you would consider this more closely. But I don't think in general, um, in terms of thinking about the amount of people that would be exposed to these medications, that you have to be worried too much about this. Okay, we have a couple questions here, but I'll encourage people to come on up. Uh, has a difference been seen in the degree of weight loss with these agents for patients with and without diabetes? That's a, <laughs> that's a great question. So I guess is that, um, so just to speak about the weight loss medications in individuals with HIV, with and without diabetes. Um, so that's a great question because the data that I showed you that we had was among individuals with diabetes, with or without HIV. So a subtle nuance there. So it's a great question. I don't think we have great prospective data on that. There is some you know observational data, retrospective data, and I think you know not comparing the two groups, but just among looking at individuals with HIV. And I think when I think about um, sort of the mean weight loss that we see in these studies, it typically has been about five or six kilograms over a year. So when you compare that to sort of the weight loss that you're seeing. Um, you know, in the, in the trials of obesity where you're getting about a 15 kilogram on average weight loss, a couple of things that you need to, th to keep in mind are that those studies in generalized obesity were much longer. The data um, that we have for persons with HIV, the observational periods have been much lower. Um, I don't think that in that observational data also that individuals may have been particularly maxed out on the dose of medication. Um, some of these individuals might have been started on the medication for diabetes, in which case the dose of semi-glutide is actually lower. So while it does look like there might be a smaller absolute amount of change, I'm not sure it's been studied well enough to know that. Um, you know, but it is plausible that it might not have as much benefit because there are other compounding factors to weight gain in among persons with HIV than there are in, um, you know, the general population. And, you know, is there something that is um, preventing, you know, a higher efficacy, the ART, or, you know, um, we know in general just even the viral reservoirs can have an effect on adipocytes and such. So I think there's a lot of other compounding factors. Okay. Can you speak to how you reframe from fat phobia and size shaming when counseling patients on these medications? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because 
Uh, I don't usually have to bring up the <laughs> bring this up with my um, patients. They are usually the first to bring it up with me because I think it's just so widespread. And honestly, I think that a lot of individuals um, want to, you know, improve their health and want to lose their weight. Um, so it hasn't been as much of an issue. But I think if you explain it in the context, we are, you know, the, it's so well known um, how linked weight gain and obesity is to, you know, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease. And so I think if you take it in and, and sort of put it in the context of the benefits that will be achieved with weight loss, that'll hopefully, you know, um, help, um, you know, in terms of recommending this to your patient. And can you give us your tips on getting these meds approved and Medicaid, especially for those with prediabetes? Absolutely. I mean, this, I mean, I, so absolutely good question. I don't know that I have all the solutions with this. Of course, um, you know, the Medicare, Medicaid um, don't approve weight loss medications, which makes this particularly difficult for, um, you know, uh, giving this to our patients who need it. Um, I do think an important point was brought up there. That is something that I do use because um, these medications may be more likely to be approved if there's a weight associated comorbidity. Um, so after it gets rejected, I may have to write a peel and sort of, you know, suggest that there's insulin resistance prediabetes. I may do a liver ultrasound also to look for fatty liver um, to see if maybe I can sort of, um, you know, um, show that there would be a benefit to this patient. I do think with what I just mentioned, um, with the data from the SELECT trial and the new um, indication, the indication will expand. Again, it won't, you know, expand to everyone, but in terms of thinking about individuals that have heart disease already, um, you know, if they're looking to lose weight, these medications will, I think, um, likely now get easily, more easily approved based on the change in the FDA indications. Are we monitoring blood sugar levels uh, and A1C at each visit when we start people on it for weight loss? Feels like we cap doses on people with diabetes due to risk of hypoglycemia, but never talk about it with people with obesity. Okay, great question. So I think um, th really the risk of hypoglycemia with these medications are quite low. Um, it, and that's because a lot of its actions are dependent on a high glucose. Um, so you typically won't see the low sugars. So um, in obesity, typically I'm checking the A1C as per usual um, every three months. Again, the A1C um, is based on a half-life of three months as well. So checking it sooner or quicker won't really do um, very much to change your management. So that every three months. But what I do do is with starting these medications, because I do worry about sort of the liver effects, is I do get a comprehensive metabolic panel with every um, dose titration uh, just to make sure that I'm not seeing the effects. I, and that comes with a fasting. If you, I ask the patient to do this fasting, I will also get a fasting glucose from that in that way. Go ahead. I have two questions. Um, one, um, how do you answer the patient who says, is this, if I'm going on this weight loss, is it forever? And the second question then off of that one is regarding, I had never heard of the idea of a tachyphylaxis, but I do have a patient who's been on, I think, semaglutide now for two years and is now slowly having um, their weight gain start to go up or they're getting back some of their weight, like about 10 pounds. Didn't know if that's something you've seen. Yeah. So thank you, both good questions and very clinically relevant. Um, so I think this is a big issue that, you know, you will get weight regain if you stop the medication. And, you know, uh, more recently, many of my patients haven't been able to fill their prescription because there's been a supply issue as well. And so you worry about that because it can happen immediately. Um, and that is no different from some of the other medications that we've seen, you know, to Samarellin with lipodystrophy. Also, when you withdraw that, you start to regain the visceral fat. Um, so I think it's a discussion that you have to have with your patient, just like you would with you know, a medication for hypertension or a medication for cholesterol, and that this may be a lifelong medication. Um, so I think, in the, you know, and I don't think we have enough long-term data, you know, um, to understand the long-term use of these medications also, which is a problem. Um, and then with regards to sort of thinking about the tachyphylaxis, so it's really thought potentially that the mechanism is that the um, vagal nerve starts to become tolerant and you get, don't get as much of a um, delayed gastric emptying. 
And so <laughs> one roundabout to this is, uh, or one important thing maybe, uh, kind of thinking about that submaximal dosing. So really uh, just titrating to a dose where they're achieving, you know, that average weight loss um, from that, because then you have room to go up on the dose if someone starts to plateau. But then that becomes an issue because it's thought, well, that's why the dual agonists may be useful, because then you jump to that and then you jump to the triple agnus, but that seems to be a perpetuating cycle, you know, for some individuals. Um, so I don't know if there's a great solution to that just yet. Okay, thank you, perfect timing. All right. Okay. 